everybody. Welcome to the Citizens Climate Lobby Virtual Earth Day. Uh, my name is Mark Reynolds. I'm the Executive Director for Citizens Climate Lobby. So there are 3,878 people who have registered for this event. Some of you will be watching live. Some of you will be watching from the recording. That includes every single state in the U.S. and the District of uh, Columbia. That includes people from countries that include Australia, Belgium, Canada, Costa Rica, Ethiopia, Egypt, France, Gambia, Germany, Japan, Mexico, New Zealand, Norway, Peru, and the United Kingdom. So welcome to all of you. In particular, I'd like to say welcome to those of you who are new to Citizens Climate Lobby. We are a grassroots, nonpartisan, nonprofit committed to creating the political will for a livable world. But it's also possible that we are the most extremist revolutionary group you've ever met because we are committed to working in the space we call the far middle. I think people are very familiar with the far left and the far right, but we believe that durable, long lasting solutions happen with solutions that can appeal to both sides of the political spectrum. And so we work in a place that we call the far middle. Here's what's gonna happen today. In just a moment, I'll be introducing Dr. Catherine Hayhoe and she'll be speaking for a while. After that, um, there'll be a short break where you'll get a chance to uh, take an action if you like. And then there'll be breakout sessions that you can attend based on your interest. Uh, our Earth Day will end at the end of those breakout sessions. So we won't be coming back and bringing everybody back together at the end. So soon our June conference will open for registration. So many of you know for the last 10 years, we've actually gone to Washington DC to hold a conference in DC, but we're gonna be doing that virtually like we are today. Are we gonna be doing a lobby day? And the answer to that is yes, of course we're doing a lobby day. We're gonna do it virtually. And those lobby events will be organized by our local chapters. So if you're interested in part, being part of the lobby day part of our June conference, please contact your group leader and you can get scheduled into a meeting. Let's remember as part of those meetings to recognize the importance our legislators play in introducing bills, putting their name on a bill, and then ultimately voting to pass it. Economists still believe that the single most important thing we need to do is to get the price right. We need a steadily rising fee on carbon-based emissions. So for the last 10 years, that's what we've been working on, making sure that a fee is put in place. Now we've been very successful in Canada. Now we've got a countrywide fee in place and we've made an enormous amount of progress here in the US and we will continue to make progress on that. Hopefully, this is the last time we're gonna to have to deal with something this dramatically because our efforts and so many people who are working on climate change will be successful and that we will uh, uh, be able to mitigate the worst possible impacts of climate change. Right now, for the most part, we're leaving King Congress alone because they need all their attention dealing with the pandemic and the economic crisis. When the time is right, we will come back to visit them on climate change uh, and in some cases, some offices have told us they're already ready, so we've been meeting with them, but we'll do this when they're, when they're ready to work with us on climate change again. There's a chance that we'll have questions today. There was one question that was submitted, well, a bunch of questions in our social media that's been selected, and then if there's time after that, there may be a chance in the Q&A to answer additional questions. Okay, so our guest today, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe. Catherine Hayhoe is the most frequently requested guest we have. She is the only person that's ever spoken on our international conference twice as the keynote speaker. She's spoken at many regional conferences, both in the US and Canada, both live and uh, remotely like she is today. Uh, she's recorded quite a few sessions for us uh, to help train us in communicating on com climate change, including I think the best thing I've ever seen on media interactions. Still, with all those presentations, my favorite by far was the first time Catherine joined us, which was in November of 2011. We weren't on Zoom yet, it was by phone. And there were two things that really jump out at me about that day. First of all, Catherine's son was still quite young and her husband was supposed to be watching him, but he was ill. So if you were listening very carefully, you could hear Dr. Hayhoe answer a question and then say something softly like, go eat your snack now. So it was really, <laughs> it was so great. But the second thing, and this was more dramatic and important, um, I had believed that the only way you could come to climate change up until then was through science. 
And it was absolutely jaw dropping for me for Catherine to show us the millions of people who wanted to come to this issue through their faith. Uh, and that broadened from there. So first when we said, oh, people could come based on their faith, we started to realize people could come from wherever they are. And it was a complete game change for us as, as an organization to understand that we wanted to meet people where they were, not where necessarily we, we were. And then the last thing, Catherine, I just want to say before uh, I turn it over to you is it was really nice getting an assistant for, a note from your assistant, Laura, saying, on this Earth Day, it's so nice to add something to Catherine's calendar instead of to take something off. So Catherine, so great to have you here and thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, Mark, we have known each other a long time. I have known CCL a long time. Didn't realize quite how long until you said that, um, but it nearly brought tears to my eyes. I love the fact that CCL is such an inclusive organization that it will welcome people from wherever they're at and really truly show people how whoever we already are is the perfect person to care about climate change. So today I didn't have to um, arrange snacks for my son. I had to tell him to stop streaming on Twitch so that he wasn't dominating the internet. <laughs> um, and we will be talking together, uh, all of us. So just a second here. Let me start my uh, slides and share them with you. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be having a conversation. Here we go. We're going to be having a conversation together um, thanks to the miracles of the internet and poll everywhere. So here we go, just a second, play from start. So if you haven't already seen this in the chat, what you wanna do on your computer, since you have your computer open or you have your phone open is go to pollev.com. That's P-O-L-L-E-V.com and enter Texas Tech, all one word. If it asks you for your name, you don't have to worry about that, anonymous is fine. So P-O-L-L-E-V.com, enter Texas Tech. This works from anywhere in the world, doesn't matter where you are. And the very first question is going to be here, and that is, go ahead and give us a dot for where you are physically located today. I see a lot of people popping up in the US, but we've got Hawaii, Alaska, Colombia, Canada, we've got Norway, we've got, wow, my geography is not so good, is that the Philippines way over there? Somewhere way over in the Pacific Ocean, which is awesome. Oh, we've got somebody in Russia. Okay, we've got a few people up in the Arctic, um, somewhere the ice pack there. Maybe your fingers aren't as precise. <laughs> and oh, we've got uh, Peru there too. We've got a few in Central America. That's awesome. We've got a few people in boats in the middle of the ocean down in Antarctica. That's also fantastic. Um, one off Madagascar. Oh, that's just dis disappeared. Okay, New Zealand. Awesome. The UK, France, Germany, Italy. Another on the ice in the Arctic. This is fantastic. Okay, now here's your second question. Ready? Second question. Do you remember the original Earth Day? Earth what? I wasn't born yet. I barely remember it and I was there. Okay, my own answer is B, just for full disclosure on that one. But we, wow, we have 20% of people online were there. That's amazing. All right, 20% were there, 30% barely remember it. So that means 50% of you are over the age of 50 doing the quickly. 40% of us were not born and a few of us are not what are not even knowing what that is. All right. Let me introduce you to what that is. Earth Day began 50 years ago and it is a celebration of basically this planet that we live on. Interestingly, if you go to Google, I love going to Google for definitions. If you go to Google, it defines an environmentalist as a person who is concerned with or advocates for the protection of the environment. Now, under this definition in Google, it gives us a bunch of words. So words that are commonly associated with environmentalists. But before I show you these words from Google, I want to ask you, if you had to summarize an environmentalist in one word, just one word, what would it be? Now, if you're going to cheat a little bit, you can use a dot or a dash to connect multiple words. Like if you want to say tree hugger, you could say tree dot hugger. Exactly, just like that. But if you had to define environmentalist in one word, what would you use? This is awesome. The bigger the word, the more people have said that word. And I love the huge variety here. So caring and steward is at the top, but we've also got passionate conservationist scientist. I love that one. 
sustainability-ist, sustainability, that's easier to pronounce, um, earth lover, that's a good one, having compassion, caring, being a naturalist, empathetic, conservationist, responsible, connected. Yes, these are all words that we associate with caring for our planet. Here are the first set of words that you see under environmentalist. And with these polls, I have to apologize because my limit is 700 people, and I know we're reaching the 700 limit very quickly. Um, in the words that Google comes up with on the first row are conservationist, preservationist, ecologist, green, and nature lover. These are words that we But then there's a second row. And here's the second row from Google, ready? eco-activist, eco-nut, eco-freak, and <laughs> tree-hugger. And then when I googled environmentalist, these are the pictures that showed up. These are the first eight pictures that showed up. So what does this communicate to us subtly an environmentalist is? Well, first of all, it communicates that environmentalist is male, not female. We've just got one female here and it's Rachel Carson. Second of all, it communicates to us that most environmentalists are dead. Yes, no, Al Gore and Bill McKibben are still very much alive, I'm happy to say, but the majority of people on this list are dead. And it also suggests that to be a good environmentalist, it helps if you have a really big beard. Yes, one, two, three, four, 50% of them have very large facial hair. So if you are a old white man, possibly dead with a very large beard, then you, then you meet the stereotype of an environmentalist. But what if we aren't and we don't? So when I Googled a picture of environmentalist, this was the first one that came up and it sort of restored my soul. So I clicked on it and here's what it said. This is very interesting. It said, the problem is that environmentalism has been successfully cast as a fringe concern rather than the basic universal right of every man, woman, and child to have a safe and healthy air, water, food, land, sea, and natural places, not to mention economies based on security and sustainability rather than corporate profit and destruction. Yes. So when it comes to Earth Day, to the planet, to environmentalism to climate change, the first most dangerous myth we've bought into is that only certain type of people care. And the variant we're looking at today, the most dangerous one, is that somehow if we come from a certain part of the political spectrum, what is happening to our planet doesn't matter to us. As if we'd be able to float around in outer space without even the resources that our planet provides. Of course we that. No matter who we are, no matter where we live, no matter what part of the political spectrum we're from, no matter what country we're from, no matter what language we speak, we all live on this planet. And this planet supplies all of the air we breathe, all of the water we drink, all of the food that we eat, all of the materials that we use that provide everything we have. We also depend on this planet, not just for the goods and the service, as well as the resources that keep us alive, we depend on this planet for its beauty as well. And that beauty is what feeds our soul, especially in these days. So I, if I were going to define an environmentalist, I would put a big red X through all of the definitions that, that Google gives us. I would simply say an environmentalist is a human who lives on planet Earth. Now we all know that there have been books and movies about people going to live on other planets. And we know that there's even a bunch of astronauts who are planning to go to Mars. Two years ago, almost three years ago now, I had the privilege of being in the front row at one of the very last talks that Stephen Hawking gave before he passed away. It was at a science festival called Starmus where I was also one of the speakers. And I got to sit there in the front row with my son also and hear him talk about climate change. And he said, as he often did before he passed away that climate change is the most existential threat facing us today. But then he said something that had me saying, what? He said, and that's why we may need to terraform Mars. And I thought to myself, 
no, there is no way that we are going to be physically able to terraform Mars before climate change overwhelms our society. There is just no way. And even if we were able to send some people to Mars, it would just be a few people. The rest of us would be left behind. So two days later, in my session, I was speaking with Lord Martin Rees, who you can see here, who is the Royal Astronomer of England and actually a close friend of Hawking's as well. So as we were backstage together, before we went on stage, and as they were putting different colored pieces of tape on our laptops, because we had the exact same laptop, I turned to him, I said, do you mind if I ask you a question? And this man is one of my personal heroes because my own undergraduate degree is in astrophysics, and he made most um, stunning discoveries early in the days um, regarding the things that I study, regarding black holes and quasars and things like that. Anyway, so I turned to him and I said, do you mind if I ask you a question? He said, certainly. So I said, do you agree with what Stephen Hawking said that, you know, we might have to terraform Mars to escape climate change? And he said, absolutely not. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to try to reproduce his accent because I'm not good at them, but he said it in a wonderful accent too. He said, absolutely not. Fixing climate change is a dawdle in the park compared to terraforming Mars. The truth is, to care about the health of our planet, we only have to be one thing, and that is a human who calls it home, and we are all that. What is the second most dangerous myth we've bought into? It's the myth that issues like habitat loss, biodiversity loss, deforestation, pollution, and climate change are distant issues. They only affect people who live far away from us or future generations, or they affect people who care about those types of things, like the eco nuts and the tree huggers, but not people like us who care about a stable economy and security and things like that. This is the second greatest myth we've bought into. And if you've heard me speak, you might've seen me show these maps before, but I'm gonna show them again because they make the point so clearly. These maps are from the Yale Program on Climate Communication. They show every county in the United States, but they have these maps for Canada as well. And honestly, they've done surveys for other countries and we see the same thing in other countries too because humans are humans. But I'll just show it from the US specifically here. Anywhere that is orange means more than 50% of people answered yes to the question. Anywhere that's blue is less than 50% and the darker the color, the more extreme the answer in either direction. So do you think the planet is warming? Most of the US is orange. Do do you think that it matters to future generations? People say, yes. How about plants and animals? Certainly. How about people in developing countries? Still mostly orange. How about people who live in the United States? Oh, we're getting a lot more, lot more blue here now. And then this one is the kicker. Do you think it matters to you? We don't think it matters to us. We think it matters to the polar bear. We think it matters to people who live far away from us, but we don't think it matters to us. And the truth is, is that our impact on the health of our planet is already affecting us here and now. There's a concept called planetary boundaries. It was created about 10 years ago and it shows all the different ways that we are pushing the boundaries of the ability of our planet to sustain not only all nearly 8 billion of us, but all of the other animal and plant species that share this planet with us. And you can see that climate change is already up to the increasing risk zone, but what is beyond increasing risk into high risk is biospheric integrity, the integrity of our biosphere. And this relates directly to the pandemic that we find ourselves in today. A World Wildlife Federation report by the Italian chapter was released the second week of March this year, right when the pandemic was sweeping across the country of Italy. What was it talking about? It was talking about the integrity of our biosphere. The fact that as we destroy natural habitat, as we encroach and infringe on ecosystems, the chances of viruses passing from animal to human populations through a process known as zoonosis is increased. 
And climate change adds in there too by affecting the supply of, it, of animals' food, by affecting where they can live, by affecting how they have to migrate. So this report talked about how the destruction of natural ecosystems, the illegal trade in wild species, and the unhygienic conditions under which we have wild domestic species of animals all contributes to the fact that viruses can jump from animal to human populations. And they concluded that conserving and maintaining nature and the benefits it provides is essential for what? For our health and our well-being. They had this helpful infographic that shows how deforestation, cutting down trees, which also produces heat trapping gas emissions, collecting and trafficking wild species, animal market, all increases the risk of these viruses jumping from human to animal populations. Our health is at the center of the risks posed by pushing our planetary boundaries. There's more. When we extract our coal by cutting the tops off mountains, why? Because it's the cheapest way to do it. Cheapest for who? Cheapest for the companies that reap the profits. As my friend Marianne Hitt wrote a number of years ago, mountaintop removal coal mining is not the cheapest for the people who actually live and work there. It is poisoning their waterways. It allows toxic heavy metals to leak into local water supply, increasing the risk of cancer, heart disease, kidney disease, birth defects, premature mortality, and more. We all know the ecological impact of oil spills that happen in our backyard, like the deep water rise in oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. But oil spills are so endemic in places like the Niger Delta in Nigeria that there is article after article after article on how the extraction of fossil fuels, it's just the extraction, we're not even talking about climate change or air pollution, just the extraction of fossil fuels is affecting the unborn, it's affecting babies, it's affecting children, it's affecting maternal health. In fact, there's so many studies on this one specific area that there is an entire Wikipedia entry on, and here's the thing, they call it environmental issues, but it's all about what? Our health. Then there's the issues of deforestation and the issues of air pollution. When we burn fossil fuels, it pollutes our air. Four years ago, a study was released showing how air pollution kills more than 5 million people around the world every year, but that was updated just last year. It turns out that air pollution kills almost 9 million people around the world. The majority of that is from fossil fuels, but in a lot of poor countries, there are also a significant number of deaths from burning um, brush and dung and other organic material inside the house to cook with. Air pollution is not an equal opportunity killer. It disproportionately affects people who live in the poorest neighborhoods right here in North America, as well as in countries around the world. In the United States, 200,000 people die from air pollution, which is primarily from fossil fuels in the US every year, 200,000 people. Who are those people? Those people are the people who already suffer from socioeconomic inequality, from injustice, from lack of access to basic health care, from the inability to live places that are safer with cleaner air. What's the connection to the pandemic? Well, for example, in Chicago, 30% of the population is African American, 60% of the deaths are African American. We know that people who live in areas that are already subject to terrible air pollution are much more vulnerable to, be, to be getting really sick from and even dying from the coronavirus pandemic. So this new, brand new research that just came out shows that 80% of the deaths across four different countries from coronavirus happened in areas where people's lungs were already weakened from what? From air pollution. Now, the slightly positive news, I'm not going to call it good news because I don't think there is any good news these days, but the slightly positive news, though, is that as the economic slowdown has rolled around the world, we have seen significant reductions in air pollution. And it's estimated that in the most polluted areas in the world, like in central China here, where you can see the massive reduction in air pollution, 
it could be that these reductions in air pollution have saved as many or more lives as were actually lost by the pandemic. Air pollution is the silent killer that has been with us for decades and even centuries. But climate change is what? Climate change is a threat multiplier. This term comes from the US military. Climate change takes all of the issues we already care about today, including our health, including air pollution, including biodiversity loss, including deforestation, including uh, all of these issues, lack of access to clean water and food and basic health care, and it exacerbates them or makes them worse. The United Nations has 17 sustainable development goals. These are very basic goals, eliminating poverty, hunger, providing good health and quality education, gender equality, clean water, sanitation, affordable clean energy, decent work. These are very basic goals. Number 13, down in the very bottom corner there, the green one down there, number 13 is climate action. But you know what? I don't think climate action should even be on this list at all. And you might be saying, what are you talking about, Catherine? You're a climate scientist. Yes, I am a climate scientist, and because I know that the only reason we care about climate change is because it is a threat multiplier, I don't think it should be on this list at all. I think it should be an overarching kind of banner on the whole list. Because the only reason we care about climate change is because it affects poverty, it exacerbates poverty, it exacerbates hunger, it impacts our health, it um, disrupts economies such that people are not able to access basic education. Women and children suffer disproportionately the impacts of a changing climate. It pollutes our water through increasing runoff from heavy precipitation events. Climate change is the threat multiplier. Fixing climate change fixes these things too, and that's why we care about it. Now, just for just a reminder, the answer is not to turn everything off like we've seen today, because the solutions today are not sustainable. Throwing people out of work so they can't feed their families, children can't go to school, industry is shuttered. That is not a sustainable solution. The reason why our global population has increased to almost 8 billion people today, the reason why our life expectancy has doubled from 40 years to 80 years in just the last 200 years, yeah, so half of the people on this call would not be on this call if it was 200 years ago. The reason why is because of energy, because we figured out how to dig up coal and then later get natural gas and oil to power our society. It has brought us the technologies that transform our world from medical advances to transportation to smartphones. And even more importantly, it has replaced massive amounts of animal labor, of human labor, and even of slave labor. The fact that the North of the United States was able to industrialize actually played a big role in the fact that they were able to support uh, freedom of slaves and they were able to win out over the South. Industrialization in Britain also contributed significantly to the abolition movement. So fossil fuels have brought us untold benefits. And if you want more, I recommend reading this, um, uh, a lot of the work that Jean-Francois Mouhot has written. They brought us untold benefits. They have increased our life expectancy. The lighter the color here, the longer our life expectancy. They've increased our life expectancy significantly. So when we look at poor areas like Central Africa, and when we see that those areas also suffer from hunger, they also suffer from um, poverty, they also suffer from energy poverty. We often think, well, what's the solution? The solution is we need sustainable energy sources. If our energy continues to come from fossil fuels, it's not the end of the planet, but it might be the end of civilization as we know it. Because our entire civilization is built on the assumption of a stable climate, but today it's changing faster than any time in the history of our civilization. And we will not be able to adapt if we don't eliminate our fossil fuel emissions. What is the solution? 
The solution is not to return to the Stone Age, to some type of utopia where 8, million, 8 billion of us all live off the land. We just can't do that today. Rather, the solution, and, and sorry, the solution is not to just shut down the economy as we've seen in the last few weeks. This is a Twitter thread I have. If you're interested in more details, check it out, where I talk about how, yes, our carbon emissions have decreased, but as the pandemic passes, they're going to ramp right back up again because they were not achieved through sustainable means. They were achieved through shutting down the economy, through throwing people out of work, and those solutions are not sustainable. What are sustainable solutions? Sustainable solutions are to use our energy much more efficiently, be much less wasteful, and to figure out how to get our energy from other sources. Like what? Well, for example, on energy efficiency, we have a long way to go. Did you know that the United States is 13 out of 16? You all from Germany, I know there's a few people from Germany on the call, you won the World Cup in energy efficiency. Energy efficiency improvements are the things that people really never think about that much. They're not that exciting, but it turns out they can take us a long way. Here in the United States, efficiency improvements could cut heat trap and gas emissions in half by 2050. It's pretty amazing. Why are we so wasteful? Because we're not paying the right price for our energy. Put an asterisk on that thought because we're going to come back to it, but that's why we're so wasteful. Speaking of socioeconomic inequality, how would efficiency help? It would save people money. These are the estimated savings in people's electricity bills for low-income houses or households across the United States alone. But then there's also sources of energy, like what? Like the energy we get from the sun, for example. Now, people often say, okay, sure, solar energy, but it would take up so much space. Really? Turns out not. These squares show how big a solar farm in the Sahara Desert would have to be in order to supply the entire world, just the EU, and then other smaller areas. People, I, I put this on Twitter back in January. I said, people worry about how much land we'd need to supply the US with clean energy. Well, it turns out that I calculated the area and so did Elon Musk separately. And we came up with something roughly comparable to what? To the area we use, and I'll zoom in on the map here, the area we currently use to grow maple syrup. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm Canadian. Maple syrup is very important. Maple syrup or golf courses. Okay, maybe we could turn a couple of those solar fields. Isn't this interesting? It's not a land use area. And Elon Musk replied, he said, good analysis, although a bit conservative. I think we could do better than that. So for the entire U.S., this is the size of the square, right where I live in Lubbock, Texas. This is the size of the square we'd have to have of solar panels to supply the entire country. But solar is not the only answer. We've got lots of wind. This is our wind energy potential. And here in Texas, we have more energy than any other country in the world. And there's a lot of other different ways to get our energy. Up in the Arctic, they're getting it from hydrokinetic power in streams. In Canada, 60% of our electricity comes from hydropower, and we have the potential to supply all of our electricity from hydropower. And Project Drawdown, which you may not be familiar with, but it is awesome. Project Drawdown lists all kinds of solutions, and I love the practice examples that I have run into. So Ball State University powering itself with geothermal power, the renewable energy group in Iowa taking waste products and turning them into biodiesel, and even new creative, much safer, much cheaper nuclear technology like New Scale that is building small modular reactors. Check these out if you want more information about them. But the bottom line is that it's been six years, six years, since fossil fuels lost the race against renewables. In 2014, more clean energy was being installed around the world than new fossil fuels. Today, we're at 70 to 30. And I love how it's happening in unexpected places and unexpected ways. So why isn't it happening faster? Because the ball is already rolling downhill. We just have to get it going faster. 
One of the biggest reasons is that we are not paying the true price for fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are subsidized to the tune of more than the Pentagon's budget in the United States and 10 times what the country spends on uh, education. And this is not just a North American issue. It is subsidized around the world. These are the subsidies on fossil fuels per person around the world. We are not paying the right price for our energy. And that is why the ball is not moving as fast as it should. And that is why, as Mark said, nearly every economist in the world, including the two who won the Nobel Prize for Economics two years ago, support putting a price on carbon. It's because it levels the playing field. It is a free market approach. It's supported by countries all around the world. My home of Canada has a national price on carbon now, as well as many other countries in the world, like Kazakhstan and the Ukraine. Yes. And China even has a price as well. And it's supported by conservative organizations too. Bush era Republicans, even most of the big oil and gas companies operate with a shadow price on carbon today. That is the number one step that would level the market and help these solutions happen faster. I want to show you these maps as just one example and get your questions ready because we are going to go there and I'm going to ask you one more question before we go there too. Here is a map and this is just the United States. I apologize for being so US centric here, but you can see this in other countries as well. Here is by county the cheapest source of new electricity. If you're going to build new electricity, the cheapest source in the west and east is currently natural gas, that's orange. In parts of the country, even Minnesota and Wisconsin, it's solar, that's purple. And then all down through the middle of the country, it's wind, that is green. What happens if we put a price on carbon? If you have a $50 a ton price on carbon, this is how the map changes. And if you have a $100 price on carbon, this is how the map changes. This is how a price on carbon works. It accelerates the positive, beneficial, clean solutions that do not pollute our air, they do not pollute our water, they provide more jobs than fossil fuels already today, and they continue to supply the energy that we need to continue to thrive. The bottom line is this, the planet's health is our health. We care about climate change because it is multiplying all of the threats we already care about today, including those on our health and that of the planet. Climate action is action for the health of the planet and for the human race. And that's why it doesn't matter who we are, where we live, what language we speak, where we fall in the political spectrum. Because the pandemic has taught us that when it really comes down to it, what matters is our health and safety and that of our loved ones, our family, our friends, our communities, our country. That is what the pandemic threatens and that is exactly what climate change threatens too. And that is why to care about a changing climate, we don't have to be anything other than a human who lives on planet Earth. So what can we do as you know, if you see my TED talk, and if you haven't, you should watch it. Talking about climate change is the single most important thing we can do, not beginning the conversation with things we disagree on, but beginning by bonding over values that we truly share, connecting the dots to climate change, and then talking about positive beneficial solutions that really work. So here's my last question to you, ready? My last question to you is this, why do you, who care about climate change, about Earth Day, about our planet, because you are a what? I didn't know that dogs had thumbs so they could type, but I'm always impressed to learn that. <laughs> I love these answers. Why do you care? Because you're a scout, because you're a Catholic or a Christian, because you're young, because you're old, because you're a parent or a grandparent, a daughter or a child, because it's your future, because you're an earthling, because you are, and I love that this is the number one word, I, because you are a human. Don't worry, I'm gonna snapshot this, I'm gonna put it on Twitter. So if you, if you find me on Twitter, you can find this figure here because I love it. We care because of who we are and we are all that, right? Thank you so much. It has been fantastic talking to you. And now what we're gonna do is I'm gonna take your questions and what you have to do is you have to type the 
question in. Don't worry about dots or dashes. You can type a whole question in. If you saw another person's question in the Q&A, you can type that one in instead. And here's the cool thing. You can upvote the questions that you want me to answer. Now, unfortunately here, I think we're still seeing answers from the previous question. You can upvote the questions you want me to answer because we don't have too much time together. I would love to spend hours with you if I could. We don't have too much time together. So instead, I'm gonna answer the questions that you upvote with the most votes, okay? So type in your whole question here. If you see a question over in the QA that you really like, go ahead and type that one in here too. It doesn't have to be your question. And then also go ahead and upvote the questions that you want me to answer most, okay? Great. And Catherine, yes. first of all, thank you so much. That was absolutely amazing, astonishingly fantastic, clear, everything. Uh, before we get to that question, can, can you answer what lessons can we learn from our response to the coronavirus that we might apply, apply to climate change? Yes, that's perfect. It gives everybody a chance to read these questions and vote. What lessons are we learning from the pandemic? Well, my last slide addressed that partially, and that is that when it all comes down to it, what really matters to all of us is the same. But we've also learned some other really important lessons, that our, our, our tendency to think it doesn't matter to us, it matters to people on the other side of the world or people who don't care about the same things as us, we radically underestimate the risks. We need to listen to the experts and the scientists when they say there is a risk, we need to take action. And you know what, when we do take action, it works, it can make a difference. So we have seen the climate crisis almost unfold in real time with the pandemic. The pandemic spreads, of course, over days to weeks, whereas climate change impacts us over years to decades. But it's as if we're seeing in a microcosm, a speeded up version of what happens if we do and do not heed the warnings that science is telling us. We are all at risk. Pandemics and climate change do not differentiate between us depending on whether we think they're real or not, but there are positive, actionable solutions that we can all take to make a difference. And for climate change, it all begins with using our voice to advocate for change at every level. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, thank you. Um, looks like there's time to take one more question here, Catherine. So do you want to take the top one or do you want to pick one of those top Okay, ones? I can be super fast. I'm going to okay. zip through here. How do we store solar energy? Batteries are making great strides, but there's also very old fashioned ways to store it, like pumping water uphill and then letting it go down. What's the one most important thing I can do today? Have a conversation about why climate change matters and what we can do to fix it. How do I communicate to fellow Christians who are concerned about poverty mm -hmm. and racism? Well, that's exactly why we care. If you care about poverty, you care about climate change. If you care about racism, you care about climate change. It is a threat multiplier that makes them worse. And how do we have climate conversations right now with the stress of the pandemic? We do so acknowledging the fear and the anxiety and the uncertainty that we're all facing. But more than ever, it is essential to talk about the positive solutions that there are that we can all engage with that would make our world a place. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. I just really, really appreciate you making yourself available. So thrilled that this worked out. And thank you so much for this and for everything you've done for us and for the planet.